Thank you guys for coming. Hope you guys are enjoying Open Source Grid so far. Uh, my name is Andy Nason. I am one of the lead developers for WordPress. I'm here from Washington, DC. And today, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, software portability. And specifically, uh, when, especially, particularly in open source, but just generally when you're building software, it needs to, in many cases, work on different systems. So portability as an art form. How do I really describe this? I, I like to think with WordPress, I presume if you're coming here, you probably know what WordPress is. Um, I like to think that WordPress has some pretty strong uh, UI and a pretty good design. So in a way, the art form can be a bit of a spin on that. But also, at the same time, a lot of the development that goes into it, uh, it requires some, well, hacks. Uh, this is, in particular, uh, the color and session group, or whatever it is, the track of this talk, which I think is really fitting in the sense that a lot of it has to do with maybe like duct tape and bubble gum uh, and how we can pull things together. Really, as soon as your code begins to be run by others, you need to really start thinking about this. Uh, we're not even talking about massive scales, just the general idea of, oh, yeah, go ahead and download and install. Uh, maybe it's a command line client, but it's only, it only will work on maybe like OS 10 versus on Linux or something like that because it's relying on something there. Or maybe you're dealing with different versions of Linux where, oh, it only works on Debian or something like that. The moment you start to deal with distributed software, you be, have this problem of how portable can we make it? Can we make it work on any system that, that gets thrown at it? Can we make it work in any situation? And how can we make it work for other people trying to build on top of it as well? Uh, and ultimately, our goal, one of our golden rules is we really can never rely on the system that we're on to the point where, ideally, if you throw WordPress on pretty much anything, uh, it should work. And we do this, we work on this through a number of different ways. It, this doesn't say lowest common denominator, which is more common in this case. It does say low. But ultimately, we are normally striving for a, a, very, a very, very low benchmark as to what is going to be acceptable. Uh, and the reason why is because we're working on a software that is very user-centric. And that is ultimately our commitment. Users don't know what PHP is. They don't necessarily know what JavaScript is. Their browser breaks because of a JavaScript error. They have no idea why. Their screen goes white. They have no idea why. They don't, the most that they might have of PHP is they might every once in a while see it as a file extension. But they don't even know that that's what it's called, a file extension. So for the most part, we're dealing with users who don't know this and shouldn't need to either. Uh, at the same time, some of our users, of course, can code. But that's not really our primary focus. And the goal ultimately is that users and developers feel like they are both respected by the platform, in part because the developers that use WordPress and buy into WordPress also understand that this is, of course, our commitment, that users do come first for us. A lot of other pieces of software will build things specifically for developers. And they say, I don't need to worry about this because you know, it's a developer platform. That's fine. In our case, though, because of the way we're marketed, because of the way that, that people have ended up adopting us with a giant user base, that's, that's really important. So how does WordPress work everywhere? Uh, of course, we focus on the user. But specifically, we can narrow this down to very particular areas where we're focusing on installation, we're focusing on tweaking, making it easy for you to always update it and easy for you to use it. And updates is something that I'll get into in a little bit as well. Uh, and we have a number of philosophies. Uh, and I'm going to cover, I'm going to touch on a few of them. We have a whole page on WordPress.org describing really what our core philosophies are. I do recommend, if you are working on an open source project that does not have a set of philosophies, have one. It makes a lot of sense. This document was written very early on, uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, and it was based on a lot of other documents that people have written for whether it was GNOME or Linux and whatnot on how, how, how we should be making decisions. Uh, and one of them, in particular, is designing for the majority. Uh, and in this case, what we're talking about here is we want to be building, of course, for our users, not for the, 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 the minority of the, of the people who are using it, whether we're dealing with uh, a small segment of developers, or in many cases, you might have the issue where there's a very loud vocal minority of people who complain about one thing, but that might not be representative of how it makes sense for the rest of your user base. Developers might absolutely hate something, but ultimately, if 99% of your user base are users, then maybe it is the right decision, and the developers will have to deal with it. Of course, the developers are probably going to be a little more smarter as to how the software works, so they can deal with it, unlike the users that can't. Uh, this is a story that came out last year where Google launched a uh, Google App Engine for PHP. And uh, in this case, of course, they kind of ours led specifically with WordPress. But the important thing is that uh, this was uh, actually a quote from Google's blog post. And it was talking about, hey, uh, we want to bring one of the most popular languages out there. PHP is 78% or something like that of all websites. 
And we want things like WordPress. And I loved, of course, hey, this is awesome that using WordPress as an example, it's the largest content management system out there. And there are others as well. But one, one thing that was really interesting is that a lot of the other PHP applications, because Google App Engine was this weird little setup where it, it, you know, you're dealing with a, like network file systems and all these other weird things, a lot of other applications had to basically hack significant amounts of the, of the code to make it work on Google App, Google App Engine. In WordPress's case, it just worked automatically. There was no changes that they needed to make at all because we're already building for that generally low common denominator. We're kind of already building for, we don't really know what file system we're going to get or anything else. So we had to make those adjustments. Uh, also in WordPress, well, in all software, all software has technical debt. Uh, there are a number of talks this week dealing with maintaining technical debt. Uh, in our case, we swim in technical debt. Um, we have more technical debt. Uh, as a ratio to lo co lines of code than I would prefer to calculate. And the reason why we have so much technical debt is because, well, first off, we don't make any breaking changes. And this is really unusual for software. Uh, most software these days follows semantic versioning in the sense that a major release can break changes, a minor release can add features but can't break changes, a patch uh, a release, of course, can you know, make those little bug fixes. Uh, we don't break changes. So even our major versions are really minor versions, if you think about it. Uh, now, for the most part, PHP makes this really easy. It has some really cool tools in the language. For those of you who are familiar with PHP, there's some stuff in the standard PHP library, like array object and whatnot, that we can take this really old associative array from, I don't know, 2004, and suddenly make it into an object, and we can make it backwards compatible, and we can kind of have listeners on these things, things like that. Unfortunately, sometimes PHP makes it really hard, in the sense that suddenly it decides to break. Uh, at some point, it no longer likes things. The function goes away, something else happens, uh, it likes to break, and it likes to also break backwards compatibility. Now, PHP's major versions aren't really major, but they are. Like, they call them major versions, but they don't break, break backwards compatibility, but then they do sometimes. And they don't even necessarily understand what, their, what the ramifications are of their changes. Uh, if you're familiar with PHP, there are, uh, the most, some of the more recent versions, 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4, updating from 5.3 to 5.4 is actually way more painful than 5.2 to 5.3. But if you asked a PHP core developer, they wouldn't understand why, because they didn't realize how much user land code actually broke in that second one rather than the first one. Just because they're like, oh, but there are bigger things that happen in that one. I'm like, yeah, but it didn't break anything. And in WordPress's case, we, while we deprecate functionality, we never outright remove it. Or if we do outright remove it, we do it in a very careful way to the point where we're not causing things to blow up. Uh, and the benefit here is that a plugin that was written on a fairly old version of WordPress, there's 30,000 plugins, in some cases maybe they haven't been updated in four or five years, they should work perfectly fine on today's version of WordPress than they did uh, in 2007 or in 2008. Along those same lines when we're building WordPress core code is that we normally write things at a fairly slow and deliberate pace. Things happen at a, at a slower speed. Now, for API development, this isn't, a, this isn't a bad thing. Some other systems might, every few years, they end up rewriting an API, or they realize, you know what, we could have done this differently. They realize after a while it was been in the wild that, you know what, this probably didn't make as much sense. Let's just try it again. Uh, in our case, we do it a bit slower because mainly when we finally want to land, land something in core, we want to make sure that it's going to be good for the next five or ten years, not just for the next major release, because we don't have the ability to just run away from it uh, a year later, we essentially get to the get to this point where we we kind of like lie in the bed that we've made, and we have to make it work for us. Uh, and one of the other aspects of, of course, dealing with adopting code is also external libraries, which in many cases are libraries, of course, that you don't have any control over. So how is it that we're able to be backwards compatible? We also have to deal with, of course, a number of external libraries. I believe 25 that we use between JavaScript and PHP. So I have four. Uh, quick case studies based on some considerations. Now, the most obvious consideration for an external library is going to be the code. That's, that's fairly obvious. Of course, there's the second one is the license. Uh, of course, that the code that you're about to use needs to be licensed appropriately for your project. The next two, though, I think that sometimes we forget about. Uh, one, of course, is whether it's maintained, the support. Uh, you don't want to adopt a library that maybe has a, an empty bug tracker, unless, of course, it's because they close them out immediately. 
You also don't want to adopt a, a, a you also don't want to adopt a project that has a an overflowing bug tracker that uh, is never getting updated, right? If they, you know, you can go to like an old SourceForge form or something like that, and you finally you find this piece of software. It's like this is exactly what I want, but literally no one has commented except to open up bug reports since 2008. That's not something you want to adopt either. So a, 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 an active bug tracker is healthy, but the support is helpful. But finally, the big one I think is philosophy. And we work very carefully in terms of making sure that when we're adopting a, a, an external library, it might not actually be the best in terms of code, but it is going to be the best, it, it is going to be most aligned with us in terms of philosophy. So four examples, one would be we were working to build a color picker in WordPress. We realized that uh, the current color picker that we had was kind of lame. Uh, and it, by kind of lame, I mean no one really could figure out how to use it. And so uh, there, was, there was a developer on WordPress.com who went through pretty much every color picker known to man and screenshotted them and user tested them and, and tried to figure out what is the absolute best model out there. And he ended up coming up with a model that didn't previously exist, but we found out that we felt like it was the most usable one in terms of simplicity. Uh, if you're used to, if you have a Mac, Mac the, the OS X operating system color picker is actually pretty good, but it's a lot. There's a five or six different panels. There's like you get the crayons, and it's kind of weird, right? So we wanted something that was simple, easy to use. Ultimately, what we ended up doing is we realized, all right, everyone using the old color picker, we need to keep that code around. And one of our big problems is that, well, one of the big things that we did to avoid that in the future is that the new color picker. We actually brought it in as an external library, even though it was written by someone in the WordPress community, but we wrapped it in our own object. That way, if we wanted to make, if we wanted to go in a different direction later, in fact, this was his idea. He said specifically, if someone else builds something better, I wanna make it really easy for us to transition off of this. So the first lesson is wrapping your external library as much as possible. Trying to have a common point, especially if you're building a public API, extensions, think plugins, whatever it might be, making sure that they're using your API, not the external library API. Of course, in this case, the external library API might also change. Uh, a great example, we use uh, underscore and backbone for uh, JavaScript uh, in WordPress pretty extensively. And there was a particular issue where uh, backbone had a wrapper that, uh, or it had a, 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 what was it, like a model or something like that that ended up not working uh, at when they updated to the major version. And we asked him why, like, you know, why did you bother to break this? It didn't seem like it was a very important thing to break. And he said, because we don't really, we didn't want it anymore. And we're like, okay, that's fine. The good thing is that we wrapped it. So we were able to just add in the literally one line of code that they removed to handle it for any plugin that was using our wrapper of this object. Very, li very little simple thing. And in this case, the other lesson is to getting to know the folks upstream. Uh, before we adopted underscore or backbone into core, we had the opportunity to sit down with the creator of backbone, Jeremy Ashenkos, who works at the New York Times, and, and talk with him one on one about this is what we want to do, what makes sense for it. We knew we were going to use underscore, we weren't sure about backbone, we didn't think we were going to use CoffeeScript, which you also created. And we came out of the conversation saying, no, not using CoffeeScript, but we are going to use underscore and backbone. We were able to speak with him about what his roadmap was, and he said, well, we're really close to a version 1.0, and after 1.0, I don't really expect us to change a whole lot which made us feel really good, really good about things because we're like, oh good, we're gonna be in a good spot. One of the other projects that we work with pretty often is jQuery and jQuery UI. Uh, and in this case, this really does come down to philosophies. Uh, and here is looking for shared philosophies means a lot when looking for an external library. jQuery, for example, it, you may have heard of it before, uh, it is fully backwards compatible from version to version. They're very careful about not breaking things. Or if they do break it, they have, they're gonna uh, create some kind of a shim to make sure that they're not gonna break it with each version. So you could still use that, for example. Uh, and this was really important for us because we wanted to adopt, obviously, UI components and also a framework that can be our common language that can lower the barrier to entry to contribute for front-end development, which is why we chose jQuery. But uh, also the idea of having shared philosophies made a lot of sense. In this case, we also work very closely with that team. Uh, we're, jQuery.com is powered by WordPress. Of course, WordPress itself uses jQuery. So there's a lot of cross-pollination there as well. So there's a lot of lessons of also getting to know your, your upstream libraries that helps. Uh, and then one more is TinyMCE, which you have also probably have heard of, which is uh, a, a visual editor that we use in WordPress. And in this case, the lesson is sometimes you have to undo breakage. Things will break, especially when you're dealing with something like content editable. If you've ever had the chance to work with it, I apologize. Um, it's kind of painful. And so we were, uh, you know, the night before a release that had been worked on for four months, it was gonna drop on December 5th, 2012, it was going to happen. 
I was leading this release. It was absolutely going to happen. We found out that uh, actually there's a major issue with the latest TinyMCE update that had been in there for three months. So we hadn't discovered it until you know the day before. Okay, that's not very fun. So sometimes we, in this case, we actually had to in JavaScript called a duck punch, is just replace a piece of it uh, on the fly without really messing with TinyMCE itself to make sure we can work around these issues. Uh, and with that, we do release early and often. We normally try and stick to maybe like a three or four to five month release cycle. Our goal would be three releases a year. Uh, and the benefit, of course, in this case is that, well, we are writing things at a fairly slow and deliberate pace, but there's a lot of things all kind of in the hopper at once that we can bring in over time as we need them. Uh, and at the same time, when re if releases get too big, uh, they end up never shipping. Uh, it's always this one more thing and this one more thing and suddenly that release slips four months, five months, six months and now eight, nine months later you're like, oh man, we should have just, we could have just shipped this feature with the next release that would have come out this month or whatever it might be. Uh, and when we're not breaking backwards compatibility, of course, this makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, so we end up trying to make sure that, uh, that the deadlines that we set uh, are good for us. Uh, and that they're, they're not really arbitrary. They help you trim that one thing from a release that really doesn't deserve to make it because here's the best part. Four months later, we already know that in December or whatever it'll be, another release will drop and it can be in there. Uh, and that kind of consistency helps a lot. Also along the lines of releases and, of, and ease of use and ease of updating is that in WordPress's case, you can just go ahead and with the push of a button, update WordPress. Hey, it works. Uh, if you've ever had a WordPress site, green, uh, big blue button, you can press it. It's really scary because it's a self-updating web application. It's not supposed to be scary, but it is. I mean, I'm scared of it, right? It's a fairly scary process for this to happen. Uh, but ultimately, we wouldn't be where we are now if we didn't bake in this ability. If we didn't have the ability to update, most people would be stuck on older versions, and WordPress probably wouldn't have spread nearly as far as it did. Um, but updates only work because they don't break. And this is where really backward, backwards compatibility comes in to play very, very important, uh, importantly. And uh, the other aspect of these seamless updates is that they also require a lot of trust in the community. Uh, in late last year, we started doing automatic updates of a PHP application running live on a server, uh, actually downloading and copying over files and making sure that we wouldn't break anything. Uh, I'm talking more about this and specifically about making smart decisions uh, in dealing with trust and community in this room in two days. Um, and really though, what I do want to say about this in particular is that uh, the trust is really important and a lot of the trust that we have right now, for example, we did about 3 million updates to the last release in about two, uh, 12 hours and we had under 100 uh, issues. It's not a bad percentage. Uh, but if we had maybe way more than 100 issues, that, uh, that trust could easily be eroded. So the fact that over 10 releases, people were able to click that button and it would pretty much always work really instilled a lot of confidence that if WordPress is going to go ahead and do it itself, it'll work fine. So ultimately, no breaking changes means that users don't need to suffer. Uh, this kind of burden is a very big problem. Uh, and developers ideally don't have this problem either because, of course, their old code from 2005, 2008, 2010 would still work because at some point, users, uh, developers are, are actually doing the right thing, which is a major issue. So we ultimately are dealing with all of the crap. Uh, we are dealing with the, th the edge cases that we can discover, that we can know about on different systems because users don't deserve it because ultimately that's, that's our commitment, user-driven software, user-centric software. So one of our other decisions is working well out of the box. Uh, and, or one of our other philosophies. And in particular on this, on this uh, angle, a user can just pick a random host, throw WordPress on there, it'll work. It doesn't really matter uh, what, its, what its capabilities are, as long as it can run PHP and MySQL, that's about the extent that it'll go. Uh, and there are some issues as to why it's actually so difficult working everywhere. And one particular one is that PHP, because it is everywhere, and it's very, very easy to configure and very easy to misconfigure, things get hairy really quickly. Uh, one particular example in PHP is this idea called magic quotes, where basically it would escape your request variables in a very terrible way. Basically, it backslash everything. It made no sense, but for a long time, it was on by default. Now, in our case, we enforced this behavior in WordPress because most plugin developers weren't really doing it right. So we also added slashes everywhere by default. And now PHP has long ago abandoned this feature, turned it off, and gotten rid of it, and WordPress is still stuck with it. We're basically like, 
holding it like, oh great, what are we going to do with this? And this is a problem that we need to solve at some point that we will, but at the moment like they made the bed for us and we had to then go lie in it. Um, so I have some data that, was, uh, that we collected from about 4,000 sites. Uh, and specifically talking about like what this, this what this market kind of looks like in terms of m configurations and misconfigurations. Quick example is that we have an HTTP API in WordPress, which is going to be fairly standard. PHP has a number of different ways to do an HTTP request, whether you're curl or whatever it might be. Uh, one other example, uh, in curl's case, it's almost everywhere, almost, but still 2%, we're still dealing with maybe a million installs. Uh, so that's obviously uh, quite a lot. Uh, of sites that wouldn't be able to, let's say, talk to WordPress.org or, or something along those lines. Uh, but in PHP's case, it has this really nifty HTTP library. It's there, it's an extension. Unfortunately, no one actually has it. So we have this like awesome library that in maybe Python you'd just be able to import. No, in PHP, uh-uh, not, not enabled, can't use it. Um, and so in this case, like we can't ignore our long tail because it actually is very, very long. Uh, where that 2% that might be, you know, that 1%, Whatever it might be, it might be 500,000 users. That's quite a number of users that might just not be able to update. Uh, a, one other example is that JSON, you might, might have heard of it once or twice. We, we realized that it wasn't on 50,000 sites. Um, this is gonna be a major problem when you're, let's say, calling functions that you'd expect to be there to dealing with something that's very basic or rudimentary, and you're realizing that some hosts, for whatever reason, disable it by default. So the oops here is in particular because we broke a number of sites like this. So we had to add back a, a, a basically an abstraction library that is about 30 times slower than the extension just because someone didn't, didn't disable the, or didn't enable the extension. Now we could, let's say, just die early and say, you need to enable JSON before completing, but what user has any idea what the hell I'm talking about in that case? None of them do. Uh, image editing is another good like, cross-platform situation. Uh, probably the most common one is GD. Uh, GD graphics library, which is cool. You can edit your images, you can crop them. It's okay, there are some better options out there. It's every, almost everywhere, but this is still about 500,000 installs that don't have the ability to manage media. That sucks, okay, that's not good. So what's next? Well, we have this other one, Image Magic, uh, which is a, a, a much better library. It produces better, better quality images. It can handle color balance a lot better, but it's barely anywhere, right? I mean, a quarter of all sites. So only a quarter of users can actually benefit from you know, not, not having discolored photos. That's pretty lame as well. Uh, and then there's another one called Gmagic, which is arguably better than both of them, and we couldn't find it on a single site. So this thing exists in the public. It's public code, but no one actually bothers to run it. So I go to a PHP conference, and they're giving a talk. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I gave a piece of this talk at this conference, and right after it was a talk on how to use the HTTP extension. And I was just giggling, making my slides, thinking like, oh, this is gonna be good because I know for a fact that no one has it anywhere. So all you're doing is you're building for the environment that you can trust. It's not gonna be portable. Another good one is if you need to deal with something like hashing or security, uh, there are sometimes this function might just be disabled. So we have to deal with the fact that there are a number of installs that we might need to adjust for. Um, or IPv6 support. We still have another, what, 500,000, 600,000 sites that don't have support for it. That's pretty lame when you think about it, and obviously is gonna cause problems in the future. But again, no user has any idea what this is, nor should they need to. So my recommendations are, uh, you need to make informed decisions, and ideally use whatever data you have, and for that, ma for that matter, you're going to need to collect some sort of baseline data. Uh, in our case, whenever a, an install asks WordPress.org, hey, um, you know, if there, is there a new update available? and we've been doing this for years, we ask a few very basic information. We, we, want to know, uh, we want to know what their PHP version is, what their MySQL version is, what locale they're running, which are all important for actually serving the update, but then we have this data that we can use to suddenly build graphs and get an idea for how things are changing over time. Or if a major hosting company says we're dropping support for this PHP version, we can see if the graph actually moves or not, uh, which can be very helpful for us. Uh, another, another good idea could be to let users opt in with user statistics. Maybe it's an extension that they enable. I know a lot of things will say, uh, please you know, send back anonymous or you know, uh, reports back to Google or whatever it might, it's usually Google, let's face it. Um, sending back those reports, collecting them, figuring out what we can do. Uh, you can also maybe run surveys, whether it's running a user survey or maybe an initiative to, hey, everyone install this thing because it'll give us some data that we can use. And then we will put all of that data in a public database that anyone can query and maybe come up with cool numbers off of. Uh, ultimately, we have a better idea of the PHP landscape than PHP does, if only because we're able to see it 
on a very broad swath rather than they're just seeing like the the, the, the servers that they're setting up or Amazon or maybe like the, the, virtual ho the, the virtual private host or whatever it might be, we're able to see the very long tail of shared hosts, which ultimately is the, the larger landscape. Uh, and you can also do things like maybe collecting deeper stats from beta testers. So if you're running a development version of your software, uh, you can go ahead and just maybe, I mean, as part of that, opting them into a few more pieces of anonymous statistics uh, is, is definitely going to be a good thing. So, uh, I want to go through two very quick case studies as to how we have done the whole jumping through hoops bit of how have we uh, been able to push our software forward. We, we do move slowly sometimes, but at the same time, we do still need to move forward. How can we do that? So one example is customizing themes. Uh, if you've used WordPress before, you may, have, you may have played around with the theme customizer where you can go in there and you can uh, basically live preview, pick a color, change whatever you wanted. It's going to go ahead and set things up for you, maybe a background, things of that nature. Uh, it's really cool. It works live. It's not like a save and surprise. You can actually wait to see when you want to publish your site. Um, but ultimately, you see that there are two different regions here. And the reason why, other than from a UI standpoint, is also the technical aspects of how this got implemented is kind of a pain. Of course, you can see on the right, we have the theme, the front end. On the left, we have the, uh, the actual dashboard or the admin or whatever that might feel like. Uh, and we started this project with a particular design constraint. We said it should work like as when we were designing this idea. It should work on every theme. They shouldn't need to add support for it. It should just automatically work. So how do we do that? Because now we're suddenly loading two completely different contexts at once. If you're familiar with WordPress, but just generally speaking, when you have a dashboard or administration area, you're normally loading different code. Maybe they, the, an extension needs to call different things, something like that. How can we make this work? And what we ended up doing is we had two different iframes that would communicate with each other. Uh, and then those were all inside of another iframe, not pictured here, and sometimes even in one more after that to make sure that we were able to load it in very distinct contexts, where the, on, the, on the right, we are only loading the theme. On the left, we're only loading the admin. We're not loading everything at once and kind of like making it work. We actually had to segregate it because we were actually loading different code at different times. And this is the only way we were going to be able to do this without, let's say, breaking a theme. Uh, it ended up being a really good constraint, because not only did we come up with a really good talk case study, uh, but also it ended up working for every single theme out of the box. Now, if we didn't need to make it work for every theme out of the box, we probably would have done it in a far simpler way. But we wanted to accept that burden because we wanted to make sure that this feature uh, could be able to be used by absolutely anyone. Another good example is we're currently working on our database schema for taxonomies. Now, a lot of different uh, database-driven applications will, over time, modify their schema, whether it's adding fields or adding tables or changing things around. The problem is that, in this case, in th for this particular area of the schema, we have three tables. We only want two, and we don't want to break anything that is querying the third table. So now it's like, all right, we have this is like a this is basically a brain teaser, right? Like, how can we fix this problem? So we can use views. We can do maybe like self joins on tables. It kind of reminds me if you guys have heard this one: uh, the the fox, the chicken, the bag of seed, and a canoe, and you can only take one at a time, and you can't leave. You know this one, anyway. Brain teaser, okay? You can't take the fox and the, you can't leave the fox and the chicken alone. You can't leave the chicken and the bag of seed alone. You have to get them from one side of the river to the other. It's these kinds of problems that we end up having to deal with a lot. There are some difficulties, other than the fact that there's a whole lot of difficulties in terms of actually building it. Maintaining it is really hard as well. Quality assurance, the actual testing is incredibly difficult. Why? Because the matrix for testing is far too complex. When you support pretty much every environment, it's really tough to actually build a matrix of all the different environments that you can test under, because the possibilities are pretty much endless. In fact, you can't really fully get an idea of how many environments are wrong out there. Uh, and you end up having to deal with things like subject matter experts. You essentially need one person who, they just, they are, their head is a file system. That's how well they know it. Because otherwise, you'll never be able to build a lot of these tasks when you're dealing with, you know, uh, that will actually break in this one random situation on like a 13-year-old file system that some sites use. Something like that. We don't, even know, we don't even really understand why in some cases something is going wrong, or certainly not why they're bothering to use it. But there's still something, some kind of consideration we need to make here. Uh, you can think about maybe the worst situation you've ever run into and then multiply that by a factor of about 10. That's the kind of edge cases that you might need to deal with. Um, you can also end up taking a different approach to the way you actually write code. You end up writing code in a far more defensive manner, which can be both good and bad. 
But you end up thinking much differently because now you can't just say, like, I can just tear up the carpets. You need to do it in a way that allows you to not, like, I don't know, throw out all of your furniture, tear up the carpets, and then buy new furniture when you're done. Right? In this case, we have to think about how can we maybe move the furniture around the room a little bit to make it so we could put hardwood floors down without you know, causing a complete mess? How can we make it so we can still live in the apartment while we're painting or whatever it might be, right? And so this kind of different approach, it can be good, but it is a fun challenge, but it can be very, very tiring. And you can kind of see where this leads to in that it can very easily burn people out, and reasonably so. So that's not to say that we have a particularly short lifespan on contributors to WordPress, uh, but it definitely is a, is a constant problem where you can kind of see sometimes if a developer you know, has been working really long on a particular area or whatever it might be, they might realize, you know what, this backwards compatibility stuff, it, like I would rather just go work on something random experimental somewhere and not need to deal with all this because it does end up being too much of a burden. With that, we do like to think that we are user centric and that we're ultimately building software for the user. So uh, this goal of being able to pick a web host at random, which is honestly exactly what users actually do, they are no better at picking a host than they are at randomly just like Googling, okay? Uh, and in this case, WordPress will run. Uh, and there is that burden that is there, but we would rather deal with the burden rather than passing off to users because they don't really understand nor should they need to. Uh, you know how to handle the edge cases better than the user, um, so why are you burdening them with it? Uh, with that, I would like to take any questions you guys might have. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you guys follow the same approach for uh, your front end stuff as far as like browser compatibility and doing work in all browsers? Or... So, yes and no. Uh, we, for the most part, with browsers being auto updated, most of them, all the good ones, um, we end up having this issue where we don't need to maybe go back as far. Uh, at the same time, there are still a lot of issues in modern browsers with, let's say, content editable and tiny MCE. Uh, Janneke could talk to you way more about some of that stuff where she primarily works on like content editable bugs, essentially, in browsers a lot of the times. Um, we technically, hypothetically, support IE7, but we don't tell anyone that we do. Um, if you log into WordPress in IE6 or IE7, you get this giant red box telling you that you're using an insecure browser. Uh, specifically because it doesn't support X-Frame options, which is why we are allowed to call it insecure pretty clearly. Uh, we do support IE8, but we're going to degrade pretty much, pretty significantly in some of those browsers. So IE7 by works, I mean, isn't just a screen of white. As long as you can kind of click around and maybe find things, it's fine. But obviously, we're not shipping you know, our rounded corners as these random PNGs that we're placing. Like, we don't care. We don't really care what it looks. I, we just care that it doesn't completely break. Um, so maybe we're a little more lenient on the how we support our browsers than we are how we support our servers. If only because I can tell a user, no, seriously, go download Chrome. I know you've heard of it by now. Rather than like, no, seriously, like you need a box on Linode. You know, they have no idea what that means. It's an extremely abusive relationship with PHP. It's honestly, it's an, it's an, for the contributors, it's an abusive relationship with WordPress, right? Like it's, it's a pain, it's definitely, it is more difficult to code in a backwards compatible manner than, than it would be, of course, to just be able to willy-nilly break things. At the same time, the ecosystem wouldn't be lar nearly as large as, as it is. Uh, plugin developers who are now contributing to, let's say, WordPress core, wouldn't be, they wouldn't have ever picked WordPress, or maybe their stuff would have broken five or six years ago. So, yeah, and, it's tough because we're hitting so many different marks where, let's say with PHP, that next version of PHP might suddenly break things. At the same time, because of the way we code, and not just backwards compatible manner, but in a portable manner, um, when PHP 5.5 got released, it, Drupal spent like six months trying to get it compatible, or uh, not that long, but they, they had to make a lot of changes to make sure it was compatible with it. And we just like checked it, we're like, yeah, it works, fine, and kept going. Because it ended up working on that system. Or when 5.4 came out, everyone's like, WordPress isn't compatible with 5.4. I'm like, I'm sorry, let me go update the page. Because it is, it works just fine with it. So no, it's definitely, a, you can call it an abusive relationship, I guess. I think that's a good way to describe it. Did that kind of get at what you were? Yeah, I mean, just like at one point, you know, is it, you, you, you say you're swimming in the technical debt, but you know, not leaving the grounding. Like what, 
We're waiting. We have floaties. Um, So, the bank. I hope not. Um, no, but that's a very good point. Obviously, we can't. In order to be supplanted by someone else, which is totally normal in software development, uh, the big thing is that they're going to have to do what we do better than we do it. And so, what we're trying to do is we don't ever want this to slow us down. So, for example, uh, when we're talking with like, maybe our designers or our front end developers or feature developers, whatever it might be. I normally tell them ignore the constraints. We'll make it backwards compatible later. Like do what you need to do, and there's a reason why this is my job. I will make sure that we will make that we will make sure that we won't break plugins in a, in a needless way. That's not to say that we don't actually have breaking changes. Of course we do. There's this we have this like favorite actions UI element that just vanished one day. Like we didn't have it in the next release, but we didn't cause plugins to just suddenly break. Firefox does this in the sense that if an extension no longer works, it'll just silently disable it because it's not that big of a deal. While we don't do that with plugins, we essentially might do that with certain hooks that they might plug into. Maybe one day there's just not working the same way anymore. Um, I, I didn't even get into the fact that you know obviously user uh, unit testing is incredibly important to this because otherwise you will of course make changes that accidentally break things in ways that you don't want. Um, yeah, it's in our case I like the idea of maybe like a rewrite dump, you know, like getting rid of it and rewriting from scratch bankruptcy. Uh, but that is what we're already doing. And I didn't really get into this too much, but we're already rewriting WordPress. We already ha we have a plan for these particular APIs need to go in this direction, and these particular APIs need to go in that direction. And uh, we know that over the next three or four years, that's what we're going to do. Now, three or four years might be one major release cycle for some for a particular piece of software. In our case, it's about ten or twelve. So it ends up looking very incrementally, and it maybe looks like we're just not really adding a lot, and then we're gaining a lot of debt. But in the, in the, at the end, we are ultimately like refreshing the system pretty well, whether it's low-level APIs or features or things like that. I try really hard to make sure this doesn't hold us back because it, we don't want it to. Uh, it does make us move a little slower and a more deliberate pace sometimes, but that's also not necessarily a bad thing because our 10 major releases to redo this one API might be, let's say, one of Drupal's to redo that same API. So that's not necessarily a bad thing to take a little longer because it might be the same amount of time that someone else might be taking. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, a lot of praying. No. Um, in our case, unit testing. I mean, we use PHP unit. We use QUnit as well for our JavaScript unit testing. Uh, in in this case, you know, of course, we're doing. I mean, we're doing continuous integration, and we're running that across all so all versions of PHP and a few different configurations. Whether it's um, maybe like different extensions of MySQL and things like that. We're not going, I wish that we could, let's say, run it infinitely on this giant massive grid of how many different configurations we've run into. Ultimately, we can't. So at that point, we just need, kind of need to enforce it really strongly in unit tests. So uh, a lot of our unit, I mean, we'll, we'll add a unit test in many cases to enforce a design decision. Uh, maybe we realize that this particular, you know, this particular variable holds a number, but it's a string. And if we convert it to a number, suddenly some strict check somewhere else in a plugin might break. So normally you would never bother to confirm that it's a string or whatever it might is, but we're going to end up writing a unit test specifically referencing this ticket that we're going to close as won't fix because we're not going to change it, enforcing that design decision so we don't then break it later. Um, yeah, we can do a lot more with testing and a lot more with the tools that we have. Uh, Aaron Jorben will actually be talking about upgrading our stagnant toolbox on Thursday, Thursday at like 11 a.m. Uh, basically this idea of and about a year and a half ago, we had essentially no build process, no real, like we had a test suite, but we didn't use it nearly as much as we should have. And now everything is well integrated and kind of cool. So, yeah. Any other questions? So, yeah, it depends on ultimately like what the impact is. So point zero, it was 0.14%, which was still, I don't know, 40,000 installs. That's a lot of users ultimately that are affected by the fact that someone disabled all extensions and then bothered to, bother to re-enable the hash extension, which is kind of important. We ended up talking to the PHP core developers and saying, hey guys, this one shouldn't be disabled by default, and they agreed. And then we said the same thing about JSON, and then about three months later, they had this big blow up in PHP world about how the 
JSON library that it was using, because it's Douglas Croc Crockford, it's not uh, compatible with their license, because he does the whole, it must, it must be used for good, not evil thing. It's a whole big giant license argument. Um, but so, like that one little thing, it's affecting how many people, it's something we need to do. Um, the percentage thing is really tough to glean. In this case, this is of course just a small subset of sites. We don't collect, let's say, extension data from all X number, tens of millions of sites that are out there. Um, it depends on how difficult it is. Hash HMAC, that particular function, can be rewritten in PHP uh, in about like 10 lines of code versus maybe shipping how, what we might we need to do to enable something else. So back when we still supported PHP 4, uh, we didn't have time zone support built in because time zone support in PHP 4 was non-existent. So things like that where we, we might just end up just gracefully de degrading that particular feature. Uh, if you don't have any of the image, image editing tools installed, Obviously, we'll let you upload the image, but we can't resize it or crop it. We just turn off the image editor. Because trying to implement our own thing in PHP is to like read the bits is kind of insane. So it really, it very much depends on, on the different angles there. Any other questions? Two or three more minutes? No? All right, guys, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.